Okay, this is the third lecture on convolutional neural networks. In this lecture, we are going to look at some well-known convolutional neural networks. And also, we are going to go over a PyTorch implementation of a simple convolutional neural network for an image classification problem. So let's get started. And we will start with LeNet which is the convolutional neural network that was created by Yen Li Kun, Professor Yen Li Kun in 1989. Now, some of you may know that Professor Li Kun is one of the pioneers in this particular area. Here is a picture of LeNet that was proposed in 1989. The input to the network is a single channel image, gray level image, consisting of 28 by 28 pixels. The first stage of the network consists of six filters or six convolution masks. These masks are all of size 5 by 5. The output of the convolution goes through a pooling operation where the pooling is performed using a 2 by 2 mask. So as a result, the output at the pooling is a 14 by 14 image. And of course, you have six such images. So you can say that at that stage, we have six feature maps. And these six feature maps are fed to another convolution layer. And in this convolution layer, there are 16 filters or 16 different masks. And the output of this stage is 10 by 10 feature map per feature. So, so there are 16 such maps. And these maps then go through a pooling stage. So the size of these maps then gets reduced to 5 by 5. So you have 16 5 by 5 maps at this stage. And this information is then flattened into a dense layer or a fully connected layer of 120 neurons, which is further fed to another fully connected layer with 84 neurons. And that layer derives the final output layer of 10 neurons. Here is another representation for LeNet. And this type of representation is very convenient and often used to talk about uh, different uh, convolutional neural networks. If you look at this picture, Basically, as we saw in the last slide, we are starting with an image of 28 by 28. That image is fed to a convolution layer where you have six such filters of size 5 by 5. Padding is of 2. Output of that stage goes to an average pooling stage. In this stage, there is a stride value of 2. Then the output goes to another convolution stage and so on and so forth. If you look at the numbers that are shown in this slide, the numbers in red are the numbers of weights or parameters for respective stages. And the numbers in green show the shape of the output at different stages. Before we go into looking at uh, more modern convolutional neural networks, what we will do is we will look at how to define a network in PyTorch and how to train a network in PyTorch. And we will do this using an image classification problem. And the data for this image classification problem will come from a data set that is known as CIFAR 10 data set. And this data set has 10 classes of objects that are present in the images. The classes are listed here. 
The images are of size 32 by 32 color images. That means there are three channels per image. And the data set consists of 60,000 images for 10 classes. That means uh, 10,000 images or 6,000 images per class. And out of 6,000 images per class, typically 5,000 are used for training and remaining 1,000 are used for testing. So that is what we will do here. 5,000 per class will be used for training. That means 50,000 images will be used for training and then 10,000 will be used for testing. The process of uh, carrying out the training is shown here. It consists of five steps. First step is load and normalize data. So we need to get the data, load it, and normalize it so that it is suitable for being used in our network. Then we need to define a convolutional neural network, how many layers, what are the filter sizes and things of that nature. Then we need to define a loss function. And then we will train the network. And once the training is complete, we should be evaluating its performance using the test data. To do the load and normalize operation in this particular case, we will be making use of Torch Vision package. This package, as I think I have sent, mentioned earlier in the previous lecture, consists of popular data sets, number of uh, model architectures, and many common image transformations that are needed for some of the work that we need to do. So here is a short list of some of the data sets, some of the models, and some of the transformations. This slide shows how the data will be read and normalized. And some of the lines of the codes are should be familiar because we have uh, discussed them earlier in the previous lecture. The thing I want to mention here is the Torch Utilities Data Data Loader. That is a utility that you need and it combines a data set and a sampler and gives you a way of presenting batches of training or testing examples to your network when, do, when you are doing learning or doing testing. So we will make use of this facility to load the data. This slide simply shows uh, some of the images that are being used for training. And some part of uh, this slide uh, sh code should be visible because we uh, got this image which has been normalized. And in the previous step, it's already in the form of a tensor. So basically, we need to convert it into a NumPy array and then only we can display it. So that's really what's going on here. Here is a slide that shows you how we are defining the network. So if you look at uh, our network definition, you will see that we are defining two convolution layers. The first convolution layer has six filters, and these filters are of size five by five. It's followed by max pooling, where the mask size is two by two. Then the second convolution layer has 16 filters on the output side. And of course, it has got six input channels, which are coming from the previous stage. And again, the size of the filters is five by five. And the output of this stage then goes to a fully connected layer, which is followed by another fully connected layer, followed by the final fully connected layer, which has 10 outputs corresponding to 10 different classes. The part over here basically defines how the computation will be carried out as the data moves from one layer to another layer. This slide shows you 
the definition of loss and the optimizer that we will be using. So basically in this particular case, let us say we have decided to use cross entropy loss function. So that is what is our loss criterion. And the optimizer is going to be SGD, stochastic gradient descent optimizer. And the learning rate is taken as 0 0.001. And we are going to be using momentum and the momentum term has a value of 0.9. This is few lines of code that basically performs the training, takes the data in batches, calculates the loss, figures out uh, how to update the weight values, and continues on. Now, the, once the training is over, we may want to check how the network performs on the test data as well as on the training data. So in this case, let us say that we get some test images from our test loader. And uh, we see these images, four of them, and we get their ground truth. So the first image is cat, second is ship, Another one is ship, and finally the fourth image is plane. So now let's look at what the uh, what our train network is telling us about these images, and that is where we are calculating that. So we got the outputs, and what we need to do is to for. Every image, we got 10 outputs because there are 10 neurons. So basically, we look at the neuron, which is giving the highest output. And whatever is the index number of that neuron, that becomes the class for the output. So in this case, if we look at the prediction, we find that the predicted values are, or the predicted class labels are truck, plane, ship, and ship. Now what we can do is we can uh, test the accuracy of our trend system on the 10,000 images that we have for testing. And these images again are presented using the data loader so that we can present them and iterate over those images. And in this case, we keep track of uh, whether ground truth matches with our prediction or not. So we find that the accuracy of this network on 10,000 images is 55%. Now, it doesn't sound very impressive. One reason is, of course, we did not train the network long enough. Another one is that uh, we could get, we could make, we could create a better architecture, deeper architecture. But uh, some of those things will take a lot more time. So that's why we just ran it for a few iterations. And we find that with that much of training, the accuracy is 55%. Now, the number looks not that good, but it is much better than random guessing accuracy because there are 10 classes. So if you were to randomly guess the labels for these images, your accuracy is going to be about 10%. So we are doing much better than random, uh, random guessing, but uh, certainly there is a scope for improving the accuracy by doing more training, by using a bigger network, and so on and so forth. This slide shows you how to calculate or, uh, the results in terms of different classes. So we find that as far as the images of the planes are concerned, they are being recognized with 61% of the accuracy. Uh, ship images are being recognized with the highest accuracy, that is 78%, while the images of the cats are basically recognized with very, very low accuracy, which is only 14%. So overall, these are the numbers for different classes, and we have a 55% accuracy. So hopefully this example gives you an idea of how to train a convolutional neural network. 
Now let's uh, start looking at modern deep convolutional neural networks. It was year 2012 with the release of AlexNet that people consider the beginning of deep neural networks because this was the first network which had many layers compared to what people were doing up to that point. And there were a number of factors that contributed to the success of AlexNet as well as to the success of uh, deep learning from that point onwards. And some of these factors are, number one, because of the internet, one could basically go over the internet and collect a large amount of image data, which is annotated. Also, in terms of the hardware, graphical processing units were available and one could use them to speed up the computation. And another important factor is the use of RELU function or rectified linear unit. Prior to that, people were using either sigmoid or hyperbolic tangent uh, nonlinearities. And as we have mentioned earlier, those nonlinearities have vanishing gradient problems. And when you are having networks of many, many layers, those nonlinearities typically cause networks not to learn or become too, too slow for any useful learning. So by replacing those nonlinearities with RELU, people were able to train the networks much faster as well as they were able to use more layers. So some of these factors contributed to AlexNet as well as number of other modern convolutional neural networks. So if you look at uh, some of the popular uh, networks uh, that are out there, uh, AlexNet came out in 19, uh, came out in 2012, sorry, <laughs> 2012. And it was a winning entry in a competition that is known as ILSVRC, which stands for ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge Competition. And in 2012, AlexNet was the winner. And then it was followed up uh, in 2014 by a network which is known as VGG. And then Google Net in 2014 was the winner. Then there are a few other networks that have become popular. So what we are going to do in the following slides is to take a look at some of these networks. We are not going to cover all of them, but we are going to cover only a few of them. So let's look at the AlexNet, which was the winner in 2012. So this network consists of, now you have five convolutional layers here. So previously people were using two or three convolutional layers. So this is the first time uh, they were able to go up to five convolutional layers. So the network has five convolutional layers followed by three fully connected layers to do the decision making. And the numbers here indicate the size of the signals at different stages, as well as the size of the convolution mass, pooling, etc., etc. So let's look at some numbers for the LXNet. The input to the network is an RGB image, size 224 by 224. 
the first stage utilized 96 filters or 96 kernels of size 11 by 11 times 3. The stride value was used uh, in the first stage was a 4. The first stage had a grouping parameter setting set to such a value that the number of output channels was 48, not 96, which is the number of the filters. So the second layer consisted of 256 filters or 256 kernels, and these kernels were of size 5 by 5, and the number of input channels to the second stage was 48. Third layer had 84 filters or 84 kernels, size 3 by 3, and the number of input channels to this stage is 256. The fourth layer had 384 kernels of size 3 by 3 and 192 channels. That means the output from third layer went to 192 channels, although you had only 84 filters there. The fifth layer consisted of 256 kernels of size 3 by 3 and the number of input channels was 192. And then two fully connected layers of size 4096 neurons each. And finally, there is a final layer of 1000 neurons because that is the number of classes we have for the problem. And if you add up all the parameters that this network has, that number turns out to be about 60 million parameters. So it was a network with humongous number of parameters. In order to train this network, let's look at some of the information regarding the data set that was used. So if you look at the ImageNet data set, that data set has over 15 million labeled high resolution images. And these images belong to roughly 22,000 categories. In the ILS VRC competition, only a subset of ImageNet images is used, and that subset consists of 1,000 categories of images. And for every category, there are 1,000 images that are used in the competition. So basically, we have about 1.2 million training images, 50,000 validation images, and 150,000 testing images. These are the images used in the LXNet training. If you look at the number of parameters and the number of training images, basically we end up with a ratio of 50 images per parameter. And with 1,000 categories, you can say that uh, this number gets down to about 0 0.05 images per category per parameter. So this is not a good number if you are trying to do learning because with such a smaller number per parameter, all you will end up is a network which is basically overtrained or a network which basically will memorize your input data and will perform very well on the training set but will not do well on the test set. So what they, they did in LXNet is they, they applied a step which you can call as a data augmentation step. So to do the overtraining or overfitting, LXNet was trained with additional data. And this additional data was generated through two augmentation techniques. One was to perform simple translation and mirror reflection on the, on the training images. So that way, if you do it, you can basically increase the number of training images. Another data augmentation technique that was utilized in LXNet was to do PCA, principal component analysis, on the RGB values of the images in the training data set and then use uh, some of the 
noise or variations derived from these eigenvalues to add to the original images so that you could create some uh, more images that are little different from the original images. So that way data augmentation was done to increase the number of images that are used for training the network. In terms of uh, learning that was used in the LXNet, dropout scheme was used in two fully connected layers. So that way you could say that regularization was achieved by this dropout process. The mini batch size of 128 was used. Momentum parameter was set to 0.9 and learning rate was used as 0.01. And as the training progressed, the decay rate was used as 0.0005. And the training went through 90 cycles through the training set of 1.2 million images. And this effort took five to six days on two NVIDIA GTX 583 gigabyte GPUs. So basically about a week of time uh, for doing the training. Here are some results that were reported for AlexNet and the idea of presenting these results is to give you an idea of uh, what's going on in different layers. So if you look at figure three in the top left corner, basically what it is showing you is the visualization of the filters, 96 filters in the first layer. These are of 11 by 11 size. And these filters are being visualized after the training is complete. And if you look at these filters, you will find that uh, many of them basically are filters that kind of represent uh, some uh, basic uh, operations like edge detection at different orientations. So essentially, you can say that the first stage convolution operation or the convolution masks were learning to perform some basic image processing operations. In terms of the performance regarding the error rate, etc., the error rate for the LXNet was 15% for the top five category. That is, whenever the correct category is not in the top five, then you say that an error has been made. So that error rate was 15%. Prior to AlexNet, the state-of-the-art error rate was 25%. So basically, AlexNet achieved a significant improvement on the state-of-the-art. As a side note, AlexNet was acquired by Google in 2013, and uh, it was used for doing photo tagging in Google beginning from May 2013. On the right hand side, you have some numbers comparing the AlexNet performance with some of the earlier methods for doing uh, visual image recognition. And the bottom right image basically shows you some of the input images and the corresponding top five categories produced by the AlexNet. In this slide, we are showing you the visualization of the second level masks. The images in the right hand panel are the input images, and the images in the left hand panel are the convolution layer response to them. So basically, if I have one of the input images, say, say the top left uh, image from this right hand panel as an input, then for that image, the second layer, convolution layer, is producing a response that looks something like this. This is the similar idea of visualization for third level or third layer of convolution. And this is for the fifth layer of visualization. So you can see that in the left-hand 
panel, you you can see that the the, the visualization is able to actually capture mo a nice grouping of the object features that are present in the input image. So, as I said, this was uh, a network that achieved great success at that time, and basically that led to a lot of interest in deep learning. So, in some sense, you can say this network kind of created all the excitement and all the hippola for deep learning. The next uh, network that we want to cover or discuss here is known as the VGG net. VGG stands for Visual Geometry Group at Oxford. That's a research group at Oxford University. And this network came out of that research group. This network is pretty similar to LXNet, except that the masks that are being used are of size three by three. And it has about twice as many layers compared to the LXNet. And this network came out in 2013. And the top five error rate given by this network was 6.8%, which is, you can see, significantly lower than what the LXNet gave about a year ago, which was about 15%. So basically, this network was able to reduce the error rate top five error rate by 50%. Here is another slide which shows you the comparison between LXNet and VGG16. Basically, you can see that both the networks have similar architecture. So the philosophy is pretty much the same, except that VG network has more layers and has a smaller convolutional kernel. Google Net came out in 2014 and it won the ImageNet challenge in that year. This network was different from the networks that were being designed up to that point. And the idea was that this network used parallel paths where di with different convolution kernel sizes, which means if you are using different kernel sizes for different uh, along different paths, that means you are able to extract image characteristics or image features at different resolutions or at different scales. The basic building block in the Google Net is called an inception block, which is shown below. And the name inception block is actually inspired by the movie Inception. So if you look at the inception block, uh, as shown here, Basically, we have number of paths going upward from the input. So in the left most path, basically all we are doing is a one by one convolution. You might remember our discussion regarding one by one convolution. It, it kind of helps in doing a dimensionality reduction. So what one by one convolution will do here is that if the number of input channel images was 10, then at the output of one by one convolution, you will have only one channel of output. Then inside two paths that we have, again, both the paths start with one by one convolution. And then on one path, we are doing a three by three mask. And on another path, we are using a five by five mask with paddings of one and two respectively. And then there is another uh, fourth path here on the rightmost side, which is three by three max pooling with a padding of one followed by one by one convolution. So essentially, if you look at this inception block, what it is doing is it is doing convolution with two different mass sizes. And also through the use of one by one convolution operation along all the paths, it's able to reduce the amount of uh, data that comes out of this stage. So here is the picture for Google Net. And if you look at the first module, which is basically 
put it in the red box there. That module is very similar to AlexNet. And then the network has nine inception modules, which basically, as I mentioned earlier, help in reducing the number of filters or the number of dimensions and also allow us to capture features at different granularities or at different resolution. Also, the use of 3 by 3 max pooling helps us in reducing the dimensionality. And instead of having multiple fully connected layers, what we have is a global average pooling. And then output of that is fed to the fully connected layer with a thousand uh, neurons on the output side to indicate which particular class label the input is from. And this network in 2014, when it won the competition, it won it by giving a 6.67% error rate for the top five categories prediction. Another interesting architecture for convolutional neural networks is what is known as the ResNet or Residual Net. This network was the winner of the challenge in 2015. And the basic idea of this network was the use of a residual connection. And this is illustrated here in this figure here. So if you look at the left-hand figure, Basically, there is no residual connection. The information or the signal is flowing as usual, as it was done in the previous uh, convolutional neural network models. But if you look at the right-hand side image, or the block on the right-hand side, this block is known as the residual block. And the difference between the left-hand block and this block is that this block has a direct forward connection over here so instead of, so so this stage instead of learning fx as it was learning there it learns now fx minus x and with the addition of x here the input here is fx which is same as the here so this is the residual block and the idea is that it turned out that uh, by having this kind of connection, uh, the training can be faster and smoother. So essentially, what the ResNet does is that it uses few standard convolution layers, and then it uses number of uh, res resonant modules in many layers. And with faster training and smoother learning, we are able to actually have many, many more layers. So ResNet with 152 layers have been uh, used. And what I'm showing you here is a ResNet with 18 layers. And in this network, there are two kinds of residual uh, modules. The one shown on the left here has a simple forward connection, but the one shown on the right here has a forward connection, but between, before this connection is complete, there is a one by one convolution here. So you have a residual module with one by one convolution or a module without convolution with a direct connection. So the one with the one by one module is shown as a dotted line in the figure below, and the one without one by one module is shown as full lines, not dotted. So this network is very popular nowadays because of faster training and one can have many more layers. And this was again very different from the prior, prior architectures and basically had very successful results. We are not going to talk about other models, but what you can do is you can go to PyTorch, 
model jew and you will find that from the pytorch model jew one can download different trained models and all these pre trained models expect rgb input and they all expect images of size at least 224 by 224 and of course you need to normalize these images using the mean and the standard value shown here so the point is that one can access or one can download different pre-trained convolutional neural networks from pytorch and use them in your application by fine tuning them with a smaller number of examples for your given application and that idea of fine tuning for a different application but using pre trained network is known as transfer learning and we will be talking about that in detail later on one thing we haven't mentioned so far is what we call as the batch normalization batch normalization refers to the normalization performed inside the network You remember uh, we have looked at several examples where the normalization of the input helps us in achieving faster uh, convergence as well as helps us in getting better results. So the same logic or same justification holds for batch normalization. Once you normalize the input and as the input travels through the network during the training obviously at different stages in different layers the values of the signals at different points are quite different so what one can do is one can perform normalization at different layers as the network is presented with different batches of examples for training so that normalization is what we call as the norm batch normalization and people have found that uh, this helps us in getting speedy convergence and better results so with that introduction or background to convolutional neural networks so let us try to wrap up this discussion by highlighting some issues with convolutional neural networks what people have seen is that these networks are able to provide excellent performance almost at the level of uh, human beings but these networks are also susceptible to some simple changes to the input as you see in this example here on the left hand side where the background is black for digit 3 and the second image has a white background but the body of the digit is in uh, in black and same thing for the next uh, pair of examples what happens is that if the network was trained using this data it fails to perform recognition on this or vice versa so what this shows is that a simple flip of the background can make network not do as well as it is supposed to do so it's very sensitive to uh, some minor changes another issue is that if if i give to the network this image the network comes up, comes back with an answer that this is image of a person and it has an 88% confidence in that if i move some of the face parts like uh, out here and give that as an input the network is still able to say this is image of a person with 90% accuracy so what this shows is that these convolutional neural networks do not appear to learn spatial relationships that are present between features and that can cause issues and problems and incorrect results occasionally another important issue with cnns is that one can 
easily fool them by making some minor changes to the input such that those changes are not visible to a human eye, but they are so small but distributed in such a way that uh, these changes can cause the network to basically fail to recognize or give an incorrect output for the input. As an example, here is an image of a dog. Here is the noise that is added to this image. So this dog plus noise, if you look at it, this is how the image looks like. But if you give this image as an input to a convolutional neural network, the network does not recognize it as a dog, rather it recognizes it as an ostrich. So that's a big issue. Same thing here, if you look at some of these uh, traffic signs, for, for example, you have a network that has been trained for traffic sign recognition, and obviously such a network will be used for uh, autonomous driving, where it will be basically recognizing those signs. And it is not difficult to fool that network and make mistakes by simply putting some stickers on traffic signs such that those stickers will cause such changes to the input that network will be fooled and will not recognize them as traffic signs but will recognize them as something else. And that could be a dangerous uh, mistake, especially if it is really uh, such a system is part of an autonomous vehicle. So there are issues with CNNs. It's not that everything is fantastic and great. They do have their limitations. They do have their issues. So we'll stop here. And uh, what we will discuss next is what we call as transfer learning and also style transfer. So those are the topics that we will be discussing down the road. Thank you. We stop here.